The Spiel Game Convention in October 2022 saw the release of not just one, not two, but at least three cooperative party games in which your goal is to score as many points as possible. It seems like an odd mini trend to be hitting the game market, but I can imagine two reasons for why this trend is taking place. One, you have the relative end of the COVID pandemic in which people are now gathering in large groups again, and it makes sense for game publishers to release designs aimed at large groups. Designs that didn't make, did not make sense in 2020 or even 2021 to some degree. The second reason for these games to be hitting the market is thanks to the success of Just One, a cooperative party game in which you're trying to score as many points as possible that was released by Belgian publisher Repo Production in 2018 and which won Spiel des Jahres in 2019. You might think of Just One as well as sort of being a follow-on to Codenames, which Czech Games Edition released in 2015, also won Spiel des Jahres for. This is a team game, so not quite the same dynamic, but Repo Production has been interested in cooperative games for quite a while. As I know from talking to the co-owners of the company back in 2010s, talk with them about the designs they were looking for. There's all sorts of things they were trying to do with team games and have a variety of team games and also then cooperative games. And they hit it out of the ballpark with just one and had huge success. In 2021, Repo Production released So Clover, another cooperative party game in which you're trying to score as many points as possible. Okay, well, you got these two. Why not continue the trend with Casper Lop's Fun Facts in 2022? I'll talk about the other games in a moment, but since Repo was the one that I could credit with starting this trend, let's look at Fun Facts first to see how this works. And then we'll get to the other two games and then talk about how they all can be compared. Here are the components of Fun Facts. Each player gets an arrow. They write their name on the arrow. They take a pen, put it in front of themselves. And the game is going to last eight rounds. You go through eight cards out of the 195 cards in the box. you got a star in which to keep score on a round. One player is going to reveal a card or read it off, and then everyone is going to write an answer on the back of their arrow. So if we have the question, if you received $50,000 in cash right now, how long would it take for you to spend it all? You're going to write a numerical answer. If you have some term, like in this case, are you spending in minutes, days, hours, years? What term is it? You're going to write that down as well. And once everyone has written down an answer, whoever is first in, their, in the round puts out their arrow, and then everyone else is going to, in turn, place their arrow relative to where they think they fall on the scale compared to everyone else. So if we have people like this, and Doug wants to go in here, and Abigail goes here, and Bob goes here, I wrote answers on the back, but I do not remember who I wrote for what. And let's say we do this, and then whoever was first on the table who had no say in where they went, well, they now get to place their arrow somewhere relative to everyone else. And once you've laid everything out, you're going to reveal the answers from bottom to top. Uh, Bob, three hours. Oh, okay, I don't know what Bob's doing with that $50,000, but it's going quick. Oh, whoa, Hank even faster, six minutes, and you reveal everything. Let's see, six months, 10 years, one week, two months, two months, and 25 years for me. Uh, I've paid off my mortgage, so I don't, I don't really have a pressing need for $50,000 right now. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it. But you look at the answers and you remove as few arrows as needed in order for everyone to be in order from low to high. So for example, if we take out these two and this one, now we've got five answers in order. Let's see, is there a different way to do this? We leave this here and this here, this is five. Take out this and this, this is five. Whatever we're going to do, the best we can do is have five in order. So we score five points for the round and that's the score for the round. So now everyone is going to erase their back. You get your arrows back again. You reveal the next card. How much do you enjoy making list? And number of cards have this symbol on it from zero to 100. You're going to rank yourself. 
So it's going to put a scale on something that does not normally have a scale. And again, you write the answer, put it out, do this eight times, and you see how high of a score you get. And then you can compare your score to the chart on the back of the rule book to see whether you're awesome or terrible or whatever. And you can record that score on your record of legends, should you wish. The concept of fun facts is straightforward, and if you're playing with people who you know, you'll probably have more success because you can more easily place yourself on the scale from low to high, but that will depend upon the questions that you are being asked. And when you look at the questions in the game, there's 195 cards, it's clear that fun facts falls into the subgenre of get to know you party games, games in which the idea is to find out something about the people you're playing with and not just complete a task as well as you can and outperform other people. The questions though, uh, a lot of them just fell flat with our group. I played one time with seven people on a review copy from Repo and we discarded a lot of cards because we weren't sure why anyone would want to know this information or find it interesting to compare these numbers. For example, how many cups of coffee and or tea have you drunk so far today? I mean, is that going to be higher than two for anyone? Maybe it is, but generally you're going to have this relatively flat scale and okay, I drink one and you drink two and uh, what does that tell me? How many keys are on your keychain? Uh, in general, how many times per month do you go to sit down restaurants, not fast food? How many hats, caps, and beanies do you own? How many times per month do you exercise? How many times per year do you go to the movie theater? These are all aspects of my life, but it's not something that I think anyone would be interested in or find engaging or find value in comparing. How many times per week do you go grocery shopping? How many first and middle names do you have? Seems like more of a European question. Uh, how many cousins do you have? I don't, I'm not interested in finding out this type of information because it doesn't really tell me something about the personality of the people at the table, eh, maybe sometimes, but for the most part, it, it is just facts and they're not fun. It's just something to learn about someone. Maybe I'm just not the audience for fun facts, but I found a lot more enjoyment when we were looking at other types of questions, such as how much do you enjoy other people? You rank yourself on a scale from zero to 100. My wife threw this card aside because she's like, I'm not talking about that which is interesting in its own. Uh, how interested are you in leading your country? Again, zero to 100. That seems like it tells more about your ambitions, your desire, your background, something about you rather than just, I own these things. Uh, if you want an all-inclusive vacation to a private island, how long would you want to stay there? That's okay, a little something. To what degree would you describe yourself as a sore loser? Hmm, how long can you keep your balance while standing on only one foot? Okay, that's sort of a fact. I don't think most people know that. You're estimating something about yourself and I can imagine people then getting up and trying it, uh, as I'll get to in one moment here. How likely are you to follow the rules in general, zero to 100? That was interesting as well because I had a lot of debate about what people meant. One person answered zero, which was obviously not true. If they thought about it for a bit, they might view themselves as a complete rule breaker or someone who just happens to coincidentally do the things that are rules, but are they really? Like that actually brought up some interesting discussion and engagement because it was much more revealing about people in terms of what they said. I think I said 80%, by the way, 85, I'm not sure. Somewhere in there, but we could debate get some idea of what are those things I'm breaking? Maybe that's a little more interesting. How good are you at cooking without a recipe? Again, zero to 100. A lot of zero and 100 were more engaging. Uh, how much would you like to study at Hogwarts? At least that's something. Again, more speculative, more something to think about rather than just a cold fact. How many M&Ms do you think you could fit in your mouth at the same time? We did that, and then by chance we had an event later that night, and two of us actually did this to challenge ourselves and see were our answers accurate. And I can fit way more than I thought. I did 82, by the way. Do not do that when other people are trying to make you laugh. You will die. Okay, so 
a lot of the questions fell flat. We discarded as many as we, way more than we used actually. We went afterward through there and we're finding others that we thought would lead to interesting challenges or results. But there's so many, like how many times do you think you can repeat, she sees cheese without messing up? Doesn't do anything for me. How many, what's the longest stretch of days you have spent sleeping in a tent? I don't know, again, it's just gonna be different people might find these things interesting or a different subset of the questions engaging, but it's a lot of things that we were filtering through to find something we wanted to answer. And that doesn't leave much in terms of playing the game. I don't wanna sort through and find things. I kinda of wanted the publisher to do that for me and come up with something engaging. So game for other people or maybe get to know you or much more casual audience, I can imagine other people liking the experience, but it fell flat for us and no one wanted to try it a second time because again, we just got to filter through all the cards and then find the things we want to do. So it's like the pre-game before the actual game that we're doing. There you go. So 13 words is from a new publisher, Captain Games, and Captain Games is owned, as far as I know, by Cedric Comont, who was one of the co-founders of Repo Production. Cedric left Repo Production, sold the company uh, to Asmodee, and went off and started his own business doing what he likes to do. And the first release is 13 Words uh, by Roman Lucert, and it's a cooperative party game similar to Just One, which was released when Cedric was still with Repo. So, okay, continuing the tradition with a new design. How does this one work? Here are the components for 13 Words, which is a game for two to eight players. You are going to give each player a combination score tracker and answer wheel. Set the score tracker to zero. You got an answer wheel. You're going to move each round to choose something from this central display. I will note that in some of these, the score tracker will move as you move the answer wheel, so you'll need to hold it down. Okay, very tight construction here. You're gonna choose one player to be the captain. You're going to put aside most of the cards and take 13 cards, lay them out around the wheel. One in the center, so you got these 13 cards that right now show 13 words. Hey, how about that? And the captain is going to look at all of the words in the perimeter and choose the word that they think most matches the word in the center. And everyone else is going to do the same, trying to match what the captain chooses. So I look at my dial, I put it down when I'm ready. Everyone else is gonna put their dial down. Let's say we have a six player game here. So we got all these markers. And all right, we're all set. What did the captain choose? Number 10, the spider. Because, right, the spider and the fly, they go together perfectly. That just works so well. Did anyone else say that? Uh, this person did. Uh, this person, they chose stamp. I'm not sure what they were thinking, or possibly this is just put out at random. Uh, jug, tap. Okay, these people, I don't know what they were thinking. Well, as long as at least one person matched the captain, the captain scores a point. They were not completely obtuse in their reasoning and someone got it. And each person that chose correctly gets a point. Everyone else gets nothing. So the potential score for a round is going from zero to two to the maximum player count, six in this case, everyone would score if they all put 10. The captain gets one point no matter how many people answer correctly. They just want at least someone, but ideally everyone gets it. You're not trying to trick them. You're trying to choose something that you think they will also choose. And likewise, they're trying to match you. Whatever card the captain chose, that gets flipped over and put in the center and you pass the captain mar marker to the next player, and now you're trying to match whatever they are going to choose with a new word. So it's actually more than 13 words you're gonna see over the course of the game, but okay, 13 words. Now we're trying to match Batak. What is going to match Batak from what's here? Are we doing butcher for a cut of meat? 
Are we doing athletes because someone has built up juicy buttocks from their workout? Uh, does someone have any other associations that you are going to have? Sometimes the choices are pretty clear. Sometimes it's a little iffier. You're going to choose something, reveal. Uh, let's say we do butcher. Okay, so you flip it over here and now you're doing attic. What is going with attic? Hmm. As you go on, the choices get harder. So toilet or makeup. With makeup, what are you doing here? Tube? Maybe tube. Let's say the captain went with tube. We flipped that over for shampoo. What's going with shampoo? Tap? Maybe tap? Probably not sale. If there were fewer choices, of course it gets harder. So as you go down and you do blind and noodle and ice, okay, ice here, Germany, jug, tap, cave, maybe cave. We think of Fight Club, we got an ice cave in there. I'm not sure what else we're getting. We're not getting ice out of a tap, not a jug. In Germany, Germany's not get that cold. Let's say we go to cave. Snooker, hmm. Okay, we've got fewer choices available, so it's more likely that you are going to match simply because there are fewer wrong things that you can give as an answer. Except there were sort of fewer wrong things to begin with, just because you're not going to choose every option. Not every option is equally viable with the word that comes up. So we do Germany and then crown. Now you've got only two. And after these two, well, one of them is going to go in the middle. What's going with crown? Jug? Tap? Tap? I think tap. You can have beer that's got a crown. Sure. All right. And that's it. We've now finished. You don't do here because, of course, everyone will get this. And now you tally up the points and see what you have done collectively and see where you fall onto the chart on the back of the captain, which is also on the rule book. And you need, okay, at least five points per player on average to win. You do that and you win. If not, never mind. Just go play again. And you try to work up to a maximum score, which is going to be 11 points per player. How'd you do? I played 13 words seven times with the player accounts ranging from four to seven, both on a review copy from Captain Games and with copies in the BGG library at BGGCon 2022. And the experiences have varied widely. We played at home in a four player game and the game fell flat. People are just like, these answers are obvious or okay. There's one of two choices really. And I don't really know why I'd go with one over the other or it just gets to feeling random at the end when you have fewer and fewer choices available. Okay, I'm just picking something, but I don't know why, or there's no sort of satisfying feeling over what I'm doing. And then I played at PTG Con over two different nights with two games each time, and people had a blast just yelling, arguing, why would you choose this? This is ridiculous, why are you doing all this? And the only difference was the environment and the players. The gameplay was the same. People still felt like answers were limited. I only had one of two choices or the answer was obvious or it was random, but people were just out there at a party. The convention was the party and people were living it up and just razzing one another and going off. So the gameplay was the same, but the environment was very different. And then I tried it at home again with seven players. And again, it feels obvious, feels random. Uh -huh. So the gameplay was the same, but the experience was just Whoa. So apparently everyone at my house is the dud. Yep, we just didn't have fun where everyone at PGG Con seemed to have way more fun. It was more obvious, but it was a different environment, a different background, and it came across differently, even though the gameplay experience was all the same. It was really interesting to see the difference between the two there because people would say it's obvious. They would laugh when you flip over the word and reveal what's on the back because everyone would look around. And, oh, I know immediately what you're doing. And I picked this. And there wasn't a dissatisfaction with it. It was more just like, I'm spending time with people and hanging out and doing all this and whatever. Doesn't matter. We'll see how we do and blah, 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 just move on. It felt very different. And I don't know. I'm surprised with that range of responses with the exact same opinion of the actual gameplay. No one said it was a bad game. It was just more the reaction to it varied to eh, to. Yeah, okay, that was awesome. 
I don't know. It's such a different feel coming across from that design and how it hit people. So let's move on from there. And then we'll talk about Not That Movie, a game by Silvano Sorrentino and DV Giochi. What was interesting is we actually got to preview this, which was this design. It was originally called Movie Night. And we saw a version of it in early 2020 before the pandemic closed everything down, recorded an overview. And then over the next two years, Sorrentino and DB Giochi developed the game very differently and it became a fully cooperative game in which you're trying to score as many points as possible. So it started competitive with, I believe, a cooperative variant, and then the cooperative game became the main game. Interesting. How does this one work? Here are the components of Not That Movie, which is for two to seven players. Each player gets a remote dial that shows the choice of the film. They're going to go see. The game lasts five rounds. You're going to see five different movies over the course of play. You have a deck of review cards, some not tokens. We'll get to those in a moment. And a deck of 80 double-sided movie title cards that show movie titles in an unusual way. You're going to shuffle the deck. It's double-sided. You can flip cards over as you wish. And then at the start of a round, you lay out 10 cards that show the movies currently playing in this theater. So we have... Breakfast Girl, Birthday of Glory, Paths for Old Men on Country Fiction. Sorry, no country fiction. An Officer Jacket, Full Metal All at Once, Everything Everywhere of Fire, Great Balls of the Opera. Okay, those are the films on the marquee. You're going to have a review. Sorry two reviews, one positive and one negative. The blue sides are all positive, the purple negative. You're going to show one card of each type for the films on display. And you are trying to now collectively go see the same movie that would generate these two reviews. I had no idea Japanese horror movies were so scary. And three, two, one, and the bomb is disarmed at the very last second. So original. So, which film is a Japanese horror movie that has a cliche bomb deactivation device, disarming scene? Each player is going to use their remote dial. Choose something that they think works. Put that down and one player is going to take the not tokens and cover up a space saying not that movie birthday of glory definitely not that movie we're not going to see that right if anyone chose birthday of glory they will reveal their answer if not this token stays there and you all agree not that movie you pass the tokens to the next player they're going to say mm, not breakfast girl definitely someone else says Great Balls of the Opera. Maybe someone decided to go see that. I don't know why they thought Great Balls of the Opera fit with a Japanese horror movie that has a bomb disarming scene. Doesn't matter. You turn this face down to show you do not score a point for it. But you continue. You pass the not tokens, continue going around the table, full metal all at once. Nope. Officer Jacket. Nope. If you have a second not token, the round ends. Otherwise, the round ends when you have placed all of the tokens and everyone agrees, well, generally, that everything everywhere of fire, definitely Japanese horror movie with a bomb disarming scene, right? Right? You score one point for each face-up not token, so six points here. If you manage to put all the tokens down, so Everyone agreed that you were going to see this movie. Great, we're all in the cinema together seeing this. You get one bonus point, so eight points total, which means your maximum score for the entire game is 40 points. The worst you can do, well, you could score nothing. You could get two no answers right away because someone wanted to go see this, and now you scored no points for the round. You can flip the cards over. You can deal out new cards. You're going to... Do this for five rounds. What are we going to go see? What's on the marquee next? The Rules of Comedy, The King of Summer, 500 Days in the Hole, Ace and Dumber, Close Encounter Booth, Phone Runner, Blade of the Universe, and Masters of the Lamb. 
hmm, what are the reviews on this film we're going to go see? They made the story of a criminal trial compelling to watch. Kudos. I only like the final act with the giant robots. Hmm. Which film are we going to go see now? Do this five times, then add up the score and see how well you do based on the now typical chart at the back of the rule book. I played Not That Movie twice, both times with seven players on a review copy from DVG Hockey, and this game went over far better than the other two for a number of reasons. You have the revelation of the movie titles themselves, which are already generating plots in your head. If you've seen any number of films, you're immediately creating synopses for what these movies could be. B. It's much more of a creative process than the revelation of the words in 13 words or the facts and fun facts or learning about the questions and fun facts. There's not much there if you're saying how many hats and beanies do you own? There's nowhere to go with that except with a number and it doesn't really say anything. There's no story behind it. It's just a plain number, whereas the movie titles are immediately generating ideas for what these things might be. You now reveal the review cards, one positive, one negative, and try to fit those together. What film could both of those reviews apply to? And now that's twisting a bit what you already had in your head, and you see, okay, is the title ironic? Is it a period piece? Is it something from the past? Is it new? Is it experimental? What is it? How could each of these titles fit those two reviews? Is that even possible? You start weeding out possibilities and you come down to a choice. And you're picturing, again, that film in your head based on those reviews and the title itself. It's already generating something Great, okay, I have this idea in mind of what this film is. Now you have the bit by bit revelation of choices or rather the exclusion of choices. So in 13 words, everyone chooses on their dial just like they do in this game, but then the captain reveals, everyone else reveals, okay, yay, boo, don't have it, no. And here you have a turn by turn exclusion of something. Not this, not this, not this. We can all agree, right? No one, pss, this movie is definitely not the one that's being talked about by the reviews. This one is not. And then someone is like, uh, actually I chose that. And then they're describing the film to you that they imagine and you're like, yeah, okay. I guess I could see where you're coming from with that. That makes perfect sense. That sounds interesting too. That'd be great. I, I would have I would have gone with you to see that one. Or no, that's ridiculous because why would any movie have blah, 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 blah. There's much more story inherent with the with the gameplay because you have the title and the reviews coming together with a story that you are then creating to apply those reviews to. It's much more of a creative process that you find in code names or just one or so clover, something that is missing or just not present by design in fun facts and 13 words. Again, fun facts, the questions are sort of dry or not very engaging and just, eh, they sort of die on the table. Or 13 words has more to it, but it's often an association. Or it's, if it's not a slam dunk obvious thing, okay, you've got some sort of association, but it's just the single words and how they relate to one another. Whereas with the movie title, again, you've got a lot more going on. You finish, you do the rounds, there's a lot more story there. We, even after we finished the game, just kept revealing movie titles and seeing what else was showing. And that was amusing on its own because of the ideas being generated by it. We're not, ex we're kind of, after two plays, we're like, okay, we're not gonna play it a third. We're kind of done with it for now. But you put it aside, you bring it out with new people, it comes up again, you got more associations, more combinations of things coming together. And it made for a far more enjoyable experience because we got to put ourselves more into the game. It's not just the game experience, but it's us, these people at the table and what we're bringing to it. And that felt much more engaging than the other two, which is more about scoring points, but not so much about the people, despite the promise, the premise of, of the fun facts. There you go. Quick overview of three cooperative party games that are the same and yet not.